Good morning. It's time for devotions. <clears throat> the theme for the week is see, judge, act. And uh, I want to stress again, you know, we, we have this, um, we have this attitude toward the word judge as if somehow it is a, a purely evil word. The implications of judge are just terrible and uh, there is nothing good about it, you know. And so what we what we do is we translate the word judge into judgment. And being judgmental is a very different thing than having good judgment. So please try to get that out of your head, you know, before we even start uh, this morning. See, judge, act. I would invite you to join with me in the invocation, if you would. Let us pray together. Almighty God, send the light of your Son into our lives anew today. Let your presence touch our minds and our hearts with your mercy, grace, and truth. Direct our thought, speech, and steps to the end that we may walk in your way today and always. In the name of Christ, amen. Well, today's reading... Here we go again. Huh. Today's reading comes from 1 Thessalonians, and it's the fifth chapter. <clears throat> it's a fair read, but uh, it's worth reading. Let's, uh, let's join together. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Paul is writing to the church in Thessalonica, <clears throat> and uh, he is preparing them for what's coming. He is encouraging them in what is going on, and he has told them he hopes to visit them again. And this is kind of how he finishes up his letter. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers and sisters, you do not need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. When they say, there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and there will be no escape. But you, beloved, are not in darkness. For that day, but you, beloved, are not in darkness for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light and children of the day. We are not of the night or of darkness. So then let us not fall asleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who are drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober and put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has destined us not for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up each other, as indeed you are doing. But we appeal to you, brothers and sisters, to respect those who labor among you and have charge of you in the Lord and admonish you. Esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. And we urge you, beloved, to, to admonish the idlers, encourage the fainthearted, help the weak, be patient with all of them. See that none of you repays evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to all. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise the words of the prophets, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good, abstain from every form of evil. May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do this. Loved, pray for us. Greet all the brothers and sisters with a holy kiss. I solemnly command you by the Lord that this letter be read to all of them. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Well, <clears throat> I think I'm going to probably spend, yeah, I may wind up spending the rest of the week on this single passage. Uh, we'll move through it a little at a time. There's so very much there. And uh, uh, the thing uh, that I want to start with is where we started at the beginning. 
Paul is writing to the church in Thessalonica. Um, people at that point had really had a, a, a sense or a feeling or a, had been encouraged in believing that Jesus would be right back, you know, that this was going to be, this life was going to be much more temporary for them and that the Lord would be returning and they would be taken up with him. And uh, uh, so that, that was their, their thought. There was a lot of concerns in many places as people who had been converted to Christianity, people who had accepted the Lordship of Jesus in their lives, uh, were dying. And they were surprised. I, I think they thought that uh, since you ex accepted Christ, you wouldn't die. You know, that he'd be back soon and he'd keep you alive till he got back so you didn't have to face death, which of course is never anything that Jesus says. But we don't we sort of pick up on that a little bit. I know that uh, my my dad was uh, 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 very much of the opinion, and this was back in this in the early well, late sixties and seventies, that the Lord would be back soon. He just really felt very convicted that that was what was going to happen, and he didn't expect to die. But he always would add on that. Uh, but it, you know, if I do, don't worry. Um, you know, I'm, uh, I'm good to go. Basically I'm, I'm in a, a good relationship with Christ and, uh, I don't want, I don't want you to mourn or any of those like it. You're not going to, you know, but anyway, um, but I remember as he was, as he was dying, he was in the hospital for about a month, a little over a month. And uh, as he was dying, I know he was very disappointed that, uh, you know, that he was headed toward that end, and, and he knew that. So we are, we are human beings, and we are very human in our, uh, in our approach to such things. So throughout the Christian world at that point in time, what part of the world was Christian, um, there was a, a growing concern at the number of people who were dying, and uh, and how come? You know, why is it that they're that they're dying? Because uh, I thought we had eternal life, and and uh, and so you know there were some issues there, and so sometimes Paul's writing is directed at that. In, in this case, um, you know, he is he is addressing I think that concern, and and his his comment basically is you know relax you know as much as anybody and the one thing you know for sure is that you don't know now personally i find you know if i'm talking to somebody that especially somebody that i don't know real well uh, when they find out that i'm a pastor of course that subject matter immediately pops to the fore you know if i meet somebody and they're a christian and they find out that i'm a pastor um they immediately say what do you think do you think the lord's coming back soon and, uh, and I, I'm getting that more and more and more. And it's kind of interesting because uh, when things are going really well, economically, um, you know, socially, relatively speaking, at least for that person, uh, I, I'm not sure there's ever a time when everybody's doing well. In fact, I'm pretty certain that's not the case. But when things are going well for a person, this isn't the thing they dwell on necessarily. Um, back again in late 60s and early 70s, it was a big movement because of uh, the generational gap between uh, the perception of what it meant the fig tree blooming again, um, being the rebirth of Jerusalem. And so, you know, and, and then it was going to be a short time before Jesus returned. So everybody's like, oh my gosh, we're, we've we got to be right in the days, you know. And, and of course, the uh, pr proliferation of nuclear devices at that point in time also promoted that because it's like, oh yeah, because we had this perception that the world was gonna be destroyed by fire this time because it wasn't gonna be a flood again. And so there were these, all these, uh, you know, as if God needed our nuclear weapons to destroy the world if that was what he decided to do, you know? I remember thinking that as a kid, I thought, God doesn't need a nuclear bomb. <laughs> you know, what, what, how's that, why is that even pertinent? But at any rate, um, you know, so it was a huge deal at that point in time. And the assumption was, well, if this means this, then this has to happen soon. And so people talk about it all the time. At this point, 
Um, believe it or not, we talk about it a lot less. There's a lot of people who talk about it a lot, but we do talk about it a lot less than we used to. But when things are going well for us, you know, I, I don't think we worry so much about that. We don't, uh, in fact, be like, okay, God, God, things are going pretty good here. You can kind of back off if you want to a little bit, and, uh, you know, your timetable can be adjusted if you want to. I don't care. I'm happy. And, uh, and then other times it's like, oh, even now, Lord Jesus, come, you know. <laughs> and, and, and we're human. We're a mess. You know, we really are. But God, God sees us through the mess, too, doesn't he? We're going to talk about that more as we get toward the end of the passage and probably at the end of the week. You know, we only got a couple days left after today. But Paul is reminding us, like, stop dwelling on that stuff. Stop trying to come up with a timetable, you know, and that's essentially what he, he says to them. He says, uh, you do not need to have anything written to you. You yourselves know very well. Uh, now, I think the, the language there suggests that Paul is like, you know, you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. You're not going to know. You, you, may, you may think, um, you know, it, it's, uh, it's close, but you're not going to know. You're not going to know. When the Lord comes, it's going to surprise all of us. Like a thief in the knife, in the night. When they say there's peace and security, and then sudden destruction come, will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and there will be no escape. You know, it's like, it's like you're waiting for the Lord to return. Be careful. Because there's going to be stuff coming with it that's not not going to be good, you know, not going to be fun, not going to be enjoyable. And uh, uh, but you, beloved, are not in the darkness. You're not you're not blinded by the darkness. Rather, you are enabled to see by the light. And and so uh, one of one of the things about that, you know, and he, he stresses that analogy for quite a while here. He goes into it in depth, and, and he says, you know, everybody's happy, everything's going well, they're all like, okay, this is cool, this is great, wonderful, everything's going good, and then all of a sudden they're going to be surprised. Whereas if you're in Christ, um, you, you are not necessarily fully satisfied, even in the best of times, nor should you be. We'll be unto us <clears throat> when we, you know, when we slide back into a rut and we're like, oh, life is good, you know, everything's fine. I got a handle on it all now, you know, and, and God says, don't ever think you have a handle on it. Keep your eyes open. Stay awake. Don't go to sleep. Don't just doze off, but be prepared. Anticipate. People often uh, uh, have just huge fascination with the book of Revelation and, you know, what's well, going to happen? When's it going to happen? Well, um, you know, my comment always has been, and you've heard me say this before, and you will hear me say it again, undoubtedly, unless you stop listening to me, um, which, you know, could very well happen. But uh, the, the reality is that the book of Revelation, what it says is, be prepared. Be prepared. Okay, so how does that all then apply to the understanding of what we are to do as see, judge, and act? Well, for one thing, we are continuously bathed in the light that if we lean on Christ, if we look to Christ, if we are open to the Holy Spirit, there will be things that we will see visually and mentally and understand that the rest of the world will not. Why? Because, uh, you know, well, the, the Bible says the things of the Spirit are basically invisible to the unspiritual man or unspiritual woman, for they are spiritually discerned. With the Holy Spirit at work in us, we ought to see things that the rest of the world doesn't see. We ought to be able to identify um, the good and the bad, you know, and the ugly, uh, if you're a Clint Eastwood fan. Um, you know, we ought to be able to see those things better than the rest of the world does. You know, we may look to e e famous economists or people that we trust for wisdom on how to act in the world. We, we look to what they say. Okay, well, in, in the spiritual realm, we look to what Christ says. We look to the vision that God has given us so that we see. All right. And then, what do we do with that? Well, 
um, Paul is going to tell them very specifically some things to do. And, uh, and so what is next on the agenda for us as Christians, once we have seen, you know, what's going on and we have, and we think that uh, God has given us a pretty clear understanding of some things that are going on, then we, then we think about how it is we judge, okay? We think about how it is and what is it that God is calling us to do in response. Okay, so good judgment says, all right, this is going on uh, and I need to respond. How would God want me to respond? That's what good judgment is. Okay, because otherwise we see and we react, as I said yesterday, and that's just become such a theme for me. Don't react. You know, don't let what you see make your knee jerk. Instead, see from a spiritual perspective, pray about it, think about what God says, think about what God's will is, and again, we're going to hit that more at the end of the week in this passage. See, think act see judge act once you've once you understand what's going on to the best of of uh, your ability with god's help not just to the best of your ability but the best of your ability with god's help then you choose a course of action so that you don't react but you choose to act i i have found that in the uh, in the last few years um, I have to stop myself on a consistent basis. And I've, I've said this to you before, too, because I'll try to go in five directions at once. And that just never works. You know, I'll start one thing and think of something else and go and, and, and just it's like it's a pressing need and I turn around and leave what I'm doing. And uh, and eventually, after about you know third turn in, in a 30 second period, I, I, I get disgusted with myself. And I stop and I say, okay, stop, think, act. And, and that's, what, that's what is being spoken of here. And that's what God's call in our lives is. Stop, look, see, think, make a judgment, choose an action, then act on it. And, uh, and if we are dependent on God for an interpretation of what we see, if we are dependent on God for his direction in terms of how we handle certain things, guys, there is so much in here that refers to how you should handle things. And again, we're going to hit more of that, right? The last part, if you were listening, the last part of the scripture there from uh, verse 12 on is instructions as to how we are to respond and how we are to live our lives, how we are to choose to act out of God's wisdom and his, you know, ability to put that wisdom into action in our lives. So, see, look, see what's happening, judge, seek out God's wisdom on it, think about it, choose a course of action according to what God says we should do, and then act. And, uh, you know, and, and, this particular passage, the part that we really kind of dealt with this morning, is a reference to the most, you know, the the ultimate uh, thing that we need to act on in the world, and that is the the uh, uh, once we are Christians, at least the first most important thing is choosing to follow Christ. But once we get to this point, it's like choosing to follow Christ when always. Choosing to follow Christ until he returns? No, it's eternal, you know. So it really, you know, that's that's where the judgment comes in, right? The wisdom, uh, the choosing your action. It really doesn't matter when he returns. Ultimately, that makes absolutely no difference whatsoever. We may have to die before he comes back. That's that's the only difference. But even then, your soul is eternal, and your body will be resurrected. So. You know, uh, we, uh, well, we hate the thoughts of death, and by the way, so does God. You know, it is not, by any stretch of the imagination, the end for a Christian. So, uh, you know, what is it that's important then? The important thing is being prepared, seeking God, 
doing what God is calling us to do, keeping our eyes open and focused. And uh, that's the call mm -hmm. of Christian life. Anyway, that's, uh, that's the message for today. And we will pick up there tomorrow. And uh, I don't know, we may get through the end of it tomorrow, but I doubt it. If we do, we'll move on from there for Friday. But may God richly bless you. And today, may you walk in the power and in the presence of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a great day. We'll see you tomorrow.